And I've always warned the Europeans of something, and no one's ever listened to it. We are not a continental power. We are not a land power anywhere but in our own hemisphere. The bigger problem are the alpha particles that could then ultimately end up in the ground. Now, how much, I don't know, but certainly not more than 40 or 50 square miles, but that's enough. That means 10 or 15 years. But be before we go into the, uh, the, the battlefield aspects of all this, I don't know if you saw uh, that CIA recruiting commercial that was posted on Telegram about two days ago. Uh, chat, uh, audience, if you haven't seen it, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, which seems to be a contradiction in terms these days, uh, posted a uh, recruiting video on Telegram, on their new Telegram channel, aimed at Russians, encouraging dissident Russians and government officials to contact Langley uh, and to basically betray their own country and to take Russia back, as they claim. Now, in, in my humble opinion, what's going to happen now is that the Russians are going to send a lot of double agents to the CIA <laughs> to put them off balance, say, yes, I want to work for you guys. Uh, and the CIA is going to become even dumber and have less intelligence on Russia. So this ties in well with what we just talked about, about the narrative getting dumber, because the situation is getting worse. And I'm getting the impression that the billions that are flowing towards Langley right now are being used for such stupid projects instead of intelligence going to advancing actual <laughs> interests uh, of the American Republic. Your take, Doug. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, the Central, Agency, uh, Central Intelligence Agency has been badly in need of, if not a, a, a dramatic overhaul, then being stripped down to the, the bare minimum structure and, and rebuilt from within. I think most people know that. The CIA has not provided us with the kind of intelligence that we could have used effectively in the past. And that's not to say that there aren't, <clears throat> aren't good people in the organization who do. Of course. The problem is that even when you have someone there who does good work, Getting the good work to the people that need it is, is not very likely to happen. So I'm not surprised by any, any of it. Although I must say that I thought this CIA approach compared with so many others that I've seen in the past was pretty good. It was clever. It raised the right questions. I can't imagine any Russian in his right mind buying into it. So I agree with you. If anybody shows up, they're probably sent in there with a mission. Here's the bad news for us. We've already got them anyway. Uh, most of them, though, are Chinese. <laughs> right, right. And the thing at the end of the day is that uh, I, I don't know how any of these double agents work very effectively be, simply because we are so irrational. Uh, our approach to everything is so incoherent, so impulsive. They must all throw up their arms and disgust because wh what do you report back? Right. I recall somebody saying, you know, during World War II, one of the Germans – uh, wrote in a memorandum, uh, we've looked at uh, U.S. military doctrine. We don't see much point in examining it because there's no evidence that anybody follows it. So <clears throat> I think you've got that kind of situation writ large now with, with Washington. Okay. We have nine brigades apparently poised to move to the east. So... Obviously, there's no doubt that uh, there's not going to be a breakthrough to Crimea. I mean, that that's on par with a miracle. But just in terms of the blow that the Russians might take on those three defensive lines or in the first defensive line that the Ukrainians want to send towards them. And we're obviously uh, basing this statement on the fact that they still want to do this counteroffensive, that it seems feasible. Uh, realistically, how far do you think the, the Ukrainians, with the equipment that they got, with the brigade structures and the fresh forces can actually uh, penetrate into the uh, places in eastern Ukraine that are currently considered Russia by the Russians? <clears throat> well, let's look at the composition of this force. <clears throat> I think we're seeing large numbers of the 30, 35,000 Ukrainian soldiers who are being trained in Great Britain, the Czech Republic, uh, Germany, and other countries in NATO return to Ukraine. So conceivably, uh, out of a force of uh, what the Ukrainians claim could be 55,000, you could have, conceivably, 25 to 30,000 well-trained soldiers. That's, that's <clears throat> for the Ukrainians, that's good news. Unfortunately, the bad news is it's only about 25,000. The rest <clears throat> of the people that would be part of this 55,000 counterattack offensive 
are people that are being pushed into the job. In other words, they're being picked up off the street, hastily trained, dragged in, young or older, uh, hardly the best uh, material from which to cobble together a dramatic uh, counteroffensive. So <clears throat> what are they going to do? Well, they'd have to concentrate all of it at a one key point. That's their best hope. Try to create a distraction elsewhere. Try to create the illusion that there's a second uh, supporting attack, but I just don't know how they would do it. And then devote whatever air defense assets they have, air and missile defense, to protect that and then launch it at a, at a particular point. Now, if they did that, uh, they might gain some ground because we know the Russians understand the utility of giving up ground. That's something that we've always miscalculated. We don't get it. We don't understand it. They're not going to defend every inch if they don't see any point to doing it, especially when they have such overwhelming superiority in attack, uh, standoff attack, rockets, missiles, artillery ammunition. So what could happen? Well, they could gain some few thousand meters potentially in one area if they were lucky. What happens then? You report victory to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the London Times, say, look, we've broken through to these areas. And uh, then eventually you come under enormous counterattack by the Russians along the lines that I just discussed. Uh, you end up uh, essentially in a fire trap then you withdraw, leaving most of the equipment that you took in there behind you, which is destroyed, and hope that you get out with more than 60 or 70 percent of the people that you went in. What have you accomplished? Well, I think from Zelensky's standpoint, he's made his masters in Washington, London, New York City, and so forth happy. He's made his oligarchs happy. Uh, what does it do for Ukraine? I'm, I'm hard-pressed to figure it out because, frankly, this is exactly what the Russians want. They want the Ukrainians to expend whatever they've got left in one big, massive effort. That makes it much easier for them to advance and take Odessa and Kharkov relatively quickly. And I, I suppose they'll sweep across most of eastern Ukraine uh, on the east side of the Dnieper River anyway. Now, then, then the question is, what do you do? Uh, if you're, if you're President Putin, you're looking for someone to talk to. Is there anybody out there? Well, you mentioned that Warsaw is now privately saying, look, we've got to come to some sort of conclusion. I hope so, because I can tell you that Washington is going to do nothing. And I've always warned the Europeans of something, and no one's ever listened to it. We are not a continental power. We are not a land power anywhere but in our own hemisphere. We are primarily an aerospace and a maritime power, much like Great Britain. And what does that mean? When things ultimately go badly for us, we sail away. We fly away. We go home. I mean, I had this conversation years ago with uh, Dave Petraeus. We were talking in 2005 in November about Iraq. And I said, why not just leave? And, of course, he flew into a rage. Oh, we can't just leave. And all, all these terrible things will happen if we leave. And I said, but, Dave, that's what we always do. Eventually, we'll just leave. And I think that's on the agenda now, very definitely for Biden and his friends in Washington. This is unsustainable over the long run. It was never sustainable for us. And so what are the Europeans going to do? Now, we have the Hungarians who are a little bit upset over the fact that the Ukrainians were thinking about destroying the gas lines from Russia. Not a good thing. We have the Poles who are saying we've had enough refugee Influx. We don't need any more, and we'd like to get back to normality. Then in France, uh, Zelensky, who's running around trying to collect more money, is being described by French journalists as a traveling circus. Well, I think it is. It's a, it's a giant facade. The question is, when does the facade collapse? And I was finally contacted yesterday by a demographer who said, what, when you said before Christmas that the numbers of people in Ukraine had dropped, from 30.5 million uh, at the beginning of this war down to somewhere in the neighborhood of between 18 and 24 million, I didn't believe you. Yeah. But he says he now sees evidence that there are no more than 20 million people in Ukraine. Well, <laughs> what does this mean for the future? What's the, what's the consequence? And now we've, we're talking already about the uh, enormous explosion in Helbitsky, 
Everyone is upset over the fact that you have this gamma radiation. Nobody's pointing out that that's going to dissipate. The bigger problem are the alpha particles that could then ultimately end up in the ground. Now, how much, I don't know, but certainly not more than 40 or 50 square miles, but that's enough. That means 10 or 15 years have to pass before you can utilize any of that soil. So clearly, if I were living in Eastern Europe, I'd say enough is enough. We, we, we like it or not, we've got to talk to the Russians. And you've got to get back to this notion of neutrality for whatever remains of Ukraine. Yeah, I don't even think Monsanto would want to touch that uh, soil when they get their hands on Ukraine. And we know they want to get their hands on Ukraine. And um, a lot of other people. And a lot of other people. Um, Doug, we had an uh, election, a presidential election in Turkey this past weekend, and we know they're going into the second round. I'm of the opinion, because I'm seeing so many signs now, obviously Turkey is playing it not for the advantage of Russia, but advantage Turkey first and foremost. But it's hard for me to see if Erdogan wins this election. I I make these bets sometimes with my friends. Who's going to be the first country that will leave NATO? Uh, There A lot are saying Hungary. Some are saying the United States will collapse and that will destroy NATO. But I'm saying that at the end of the day, it's going to be Erdogan's or some Turkish politician's power play in the next decade or less that'll lead to the disintegration of NATO as Turkey has, if I have my numbers correct, the second largest army in the alliance, which will create a whole different situation in the Mediterranean and so on and so on. Uh, what's your opinion on the potential effects of a uh, emboldened and stronger Erdogan within the NATO alliance and vis-a-vis the entire situation uh, currently ongoing in Ukraine? Well, I think something's important to consider once again, that both President Putin and President Erdogan have turned out to be very cautious, thoughtful strategists. These are not impulsive personalities. They're the diametrically opposite uh, personality types to what we have in Washington. No one is emoting in Ankara. No one is emoting in Moscow. So Erdogan is effectively taking his country largely out of NATO. We regard them, frankly, more and more as a quote-unquote paper ally. I uh, I thought we should have gotten our forces out of Turkey, particularly uh, the air forces and, and certainly the munitions, since we allegedly have some nuclear weapons still in Turkey, get them all out years ago. Uh, because the, the rationale, the raison d'etre for NATO in the Mediterranean just doesn't exist any longer. Uh, there, there are new actors in the region. It's not just uh, Turkey. It's also Israel. Israel now has interests in the Mediterranean that it did not previously have in terms of offshore oil and gas and drilling. Same thing is true for Egypt and Tunisia, other, other countries. Then you have Greece, of course, which also has interests. The, the bottom line is NATO no longer has the, the utility that it once did as preventing conflict. If conflict breaks out on a regional basis, it will be regional actors that ultimately solve it and end it, not NATO. So, But I don't think Mr. Erdogan needs to stand up and say, well, we've had it, we're leaving NATO. I mean, he can effectively do pretty much whatever he wants right now without uh, concern about being punished for it. Again, the real question is, is NATO meaningful at all anymore? And that's the question we're going to answer over the next six months, I think, pretty emphatically.